Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this PhD Defense Seminar. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bader. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Electronics Design at Mitsubishi University and today I will be the chairman of this seminar uh, in which Xin Yu Ma, the uh, respondent, will present and defend her thesis. Um, I would really like to welcome especially a, a, a few people um, we have in Zoom, for example, the, the opponent, um, Dr. Alex Vadell from the University of Southampton in the UK. Um, and then we have three people in the examination board, in the examination committee, um, which are uh, Dr. Brandon O'Flynn from the Tyndall, Institute of, uh, the Tyndall National Institute and the University College Cork in, in Ireland. Um, we have Professor Olfa Kanun from the Technical University in Chemnitz in Germany. Um, and then we have uh, Professor Kent Bertelsson uh, from Mitsubishi University. So a very well, uh, warm welcome to, especially to you and uh, thank you for participating in this uh, in the seminar. Um, so the respondent, uh, Xin Yu Ma, please join me here. Um, uh, so she will defend her thesis entitled uh, Power Estimation for Indoor Light Energy Harvesting Today. Uh, the thesis and her research has been conducted at the Department of Electronics Design at the Mitsubishi University um, during the last years. Um, and I would like to, before she starts, um, um, to, to present her thesis, uh, to provide summary, to shortly go through the, um, the procedure of the day. Um, before I do that, I also want to introduce uh, Professor Bengt Ullmann, who has been the, the main supervisor for this research, and I myself uh, have been a co-supervisor. Um, so, so the procedure is as follows. Um, after this introduction um, and this welcome, um, I will give the word to, to Shin Yuma, um, who will give a short presentation of her work, about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, after that, uh, we will have a very short break just to, to set up, and at that time, the, the YouTube broadcast will, will stop. Um, and, and we will conduct the, the um, discussion, the scientific discussion and the examination. Uh, so after that break, uh, we will start with, with the opponent, and the opponent will lead a discussion uh, with the respondent, Xin Yuma, um, which also will take approximately uh, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on, on the discussion, of course. Um, after this scientific discussion, um, the examination board will have, have the chance to ask a few questions to, to the respondent um, and we will go uh, individual through the examination board in a specific order. Um, and I will, I will, of course, guide you through this, this process as well. Um, and afterwards, when, when the examination board um, is, is happy, uh, we will open up the, the, the audience uh, to ask questions, so the public can ask questions to, to the respondent as well. Um, and you can do that uh, two ways. You can either use a chat function in Zoom and, and pose a question, and we will repeat the question for the audience, of course, um, before we before Shin Yuma will answer it. Um, or you can raise your hand and, and ask the question uh, or orally, of course, as well. Um, so when that is closed, then that will close basically the, the, the open session, the public session of, of asking discussions. Uh, after that, the graduation board will, will um, convene in another room, um, have a separate graduation meeting or examination meeting, discuss this work uh, and make a decision. And after that meeting, which will probably take something between 15 to 30 minutes, um, we will come back into, into this Zoom room um, and, and we will announce the decision. Um, well, with this, um, just before I give the word to you for the presentation, I will ask you one more thing, and that is if you have um, any changes or um, any, um, uh, any errors or mistakes that you want to, to announce before, before you start your presentation, or if you want to defend your thesis uh, in the state that has been printed. Uh, no, it's only the, the paper two that uh, is in manuscript uh, in my thesis, but now it is published uh, and it accepted by the IEEE access. So only this. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, mm. Well then, I leave the floor to you and uh, you will start with the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. 
I would say uh, thank you to the opponent, the committee members, and all of the audience. Welcome to my doctor thesis presentation. Today, my topic is power estimation for indoor light energy harvesting. The usage of wireless sensors has become more and more popular in recent years. Think about this. If we want to put a self-powered sensor node in a room, we should know the available energy that could be harvested from the ambient light conditions. Without enough energy, the sensor node would die. So my research topic is to propose a power estimation method to estimate the available energy that could be harvested from different indoor light conditions. Why energy harvesting is needed? Wireless sensor networks has been applied in every wire of our daily life. Some typical wireless sensor network indoor applications include, but not limited to, environmental monitoring, security and surveillance, greenhouse agriculture, smart building, health care, and uh, industrial monitoring. The main challenge for these applications is to find a reliable and long-term power supply. The traditional power supply, battery, have limited lifetime and storage capacity. The deployment, the deployment location for some of the wireless sensor networks are difficult to be revisited. So this will make the rechargement and the exchange of the batteries difficult and costly. If we think about uh, harvest some energy from the ambient environment, for example, the sunlight or the wind, that otherwise would be lost and maybe can be harvested and used in the applications. This is what we mean by energy harvesting which is a conversion of the ambient environment energy into electricity. Some examples of energy harvesting sources from the ambient environment is light, thermal energy, vibration, electromagnetic, and so on. Today, our topic will focus on the light energy harvesting. This is a typical structure of the light energy harvesting system. It is composed by the transducer, which is a solar cell, an energy buffer, a DC-DC converter, and a load. Why power estimation method is needed for designing a light energy harvesting system? Because there are many problems need to be solved before we design a light energy harvesting system. For example, the deployment location. Since in different locations, somewhere the light is strong, somewhere the light is strong, and somewhere the light is weak, a, an accurate uh, power estimation method can help to accurately get an idea about the possible energy that could be harvested from different location. So it can help to find the most suitable location to be deployed. It can also help to uh, dimensioning of the solar panel size and the energy buffer storage capacity and the lowest power consumption. Firstly, we would have a look at uh, what is a typical light condition. There are huge differences between the outdoor and the indoor light condition. It is composed by the illuminance and the spectrum. If we think about the illuminance of the, of the outdoor conditions, it is typically hundreds of thousands of lux. But for indoor condition, it is typically hundreds of lux. And uh, the spectrum for the outdoor condition is the spectrum of sunlight. But the spectrum for indoor condition, when the light sources change, the spectrum would also change accordingly. So the research question is, what is required if we want to do power estimation for light energy harvesting? If we want to do power estimation, the most direct way is to have a measurement on the PV cells. 
it needs no PV models, and it is accurate. But the data is only valid for specific solar panels, and it needs a long time and many locations to do the measurement. So if we don't want to have any measurement on the PV cells, what we could do is to have some measurement on the light conditions. Then we will need PV models. So what data is needed to be measured from the ambient light condition? Some people have proposed a method based on some assumptions on the, loss, on the light source types. So they will use the illuminance-based power estimation method. It is interesting to have a look at how does the illuminance-based power estimation method works. For example, if we got some measurement on the illuminance of the ambient environment, we could got the value of the lux level. And uh, with a illuminance-based PV model, we could get an estimate of the output power. Here, this is a single-factor conversion that uh, this equation can be used as a illuminance-based PV model. And uh, this 683 lux equals to 1 watt per square meter is defined by the CIE 1993 standard. And uh, this 683 is a spectral relevant constant. And uh, this is defined for a very specific uh, spectrum. The peak of the spectrum for this function is 555 nanometer, according to the human eye's most uh, sensitive wavelengths. However, this number is only valid for this defined spectrum. If the spectrum is changed, this number should also change. So we can shortly conclude that the illuminance-based power estimation method is better for the light conditions with unvarying and known spectra. But the spectra of the ambient environment is often complex and time-varying. For example, here, we can have an overview of the spectrum of different indoor light sources and the sunlight. At the same uh, illuminance, 600 lux, we can see that the halogen, fluorescent, warm light, cold light, and the solar simulator, they distributed differently on the wavelength range. Also, the spectral response of different uh, solar panel materials uh, is also different. This is based on uh, different PV technology. And with the different uh, spectral response, the power output would also be different. Here, this figure comes from a researcher in 2014, which has shown that uh, under the same illuminance, 500 lux, for the same solar panel type, type. This is one amorphous solar panel. And uh, we can see that uh, the output power density of uh, incandescent, uh, fluorescent, and light are totally different. This indicates that uh, the illuminance is not the only influence factor for estimating the output power of PV cells. Spectrum also have contributions. So related works have different assumptions on the light source types uh, in order to use the illuminance-based ba power estimation method. If we don't want to have any assumption on the light source types, maybe we could use the spectrum and the illuminance-based power estimation method. Here is the one spectrum and the illuminance-based power estimation method. If we have the information of the spectral irradiance and the spectral response of the solar cell, uh, we can use this theory function to calculate the short circuit current. And uh, this can be used to estimate the output power. But the problem is how to obtain how to efficiently obtain the light spectrum and the spectral responses curves in realistic scenarios. 
by using a spectrometer is the easiest way to get a full spectrum. But uh, for measurement of long time and many locations, spectrometer have a huge data volume and high cost. Maybe it is not necessary to measure the full spectrum. Maybe some light sensors that can provide limited spectrum information can be used to characterize the ambient environment. So we, we can have a look at some commonly used spectral sensors. Mm, by combining different light sensors, we could get an idea about the spectrum. For example, this Lux sensor can be used to distinguish the visible and the infrared wavelength range of the spectrum. And this RGB sensor can be used to distinguish the red, green, and blue color composition of the visible wavelength range. Based on this spectral information, we can try to train a classifier and classify the ambient environment. So I would like to propose a power estimation method based on both the spectrum and the illuminance. I suppose that the power estimation method could be done in this way. Uh, with the spectral information that uh, obtained by the light sensors from the ambient environment, I can make a classification procedure to classify the ambient environment into different light type. And correspondingly, I will have individual solar panel models for different light type. With the illuminance and the light type information, these um, solar panel models would give the output of the power. So there are, number, there are a number of things to be investigated in this method. Firstly, we begin with the classification procedure. If we got spectral information from the ambient environment, what information is needed? Or the question will be, could, uh, what is the minimum light sensor information needed to reliably classify the indoor light sources. There are many parameters that are coming from the uh, measurement from the sensors from the ambient environment. And um, we could see that, uh, for example, the LUX sensor can provide these parameters, and uh, the RGB sensor, and uh, the solar panel itself can provide some, some information, for example, like the maximum power point. Um, in order to find the minimum light sensor information configuration, I grouped them into different uh, mm, feature sites, and uh, I tested them one by one. Ideally, I would not uh, use uh, the information of this yellow box, since the maximum power point is what we, what we want to predict. This is just a test to have a look at uh, if the maximum power point would have any influence on the accuracy of the classifier. So here I have a result for the minimum sensor information. I have tested the classifier, all of the classifier types provided by MATLAB toolbox and all of the sensor information configurations. This accuracy is represented, is represented in, in percentage, and this color code means that uh, white color means the accuracy is high, and uh, black color means the accuracy is low. Um, the main task is to find the minimum sensor information, so we can just have a look at the left hand direction with less sensor information configurations. It is obvious that uh, the LUX sensor and the RGB sensor can give sufficient classification results for many classifiers, which means that uh, these minimum data combinations from A and B, the LUX sensor and the RGB sensor, is possible to be used to distinguish the ambient environment. Next, uh, we will have a look at uh, the PV models. Uh, 
a PV model models the procedure of converting the illuminance to power. For a specific light source type, for example, a fluorescent or light, could we find a model that the output power related to the lux level? Based on this equation, IV curves is the output of a solar cell, and uh, if we use the uh, if we use one IV curve as a reference condition and uh, extract some information from this light condition, uh, if we can scale the, the information to another light condition, and uh, to produce the IV curve of that light condition, we could say that uh, there is a relationship between the lux level and the output power for this specific light source type. And uh, if, this, uh, if this is possible, we could say that uh, this PV model is scalable. Here we have the conventional PV models, which are based on equivalent circuits. The most popular is the one diode model and the two diode model. One diode model has five unknown parameters, and the two diode model have seven unknown parameters. People have multiple parameter instruction methods to get the values of these unknowns. For high illuminance conditions, um, people, use, people often um, have the parameter instruction method based on these three remarkable points the short circuit current point, the open circuit voltage point, and the maximum power point. However, three functions are not enough to solve equations with five or seven unknowns. So people often have some simplifications, for example, assuming some numbers for some of the parameters, such as make, uh, make the ideality factor equals to one or two, which is uh, mm, w w what they want to do is just to reduce the number of the, non of the unknowns by these simplifications. And uh, people also use other information, for example, the slope of the remarkable points or other arbitrary points. If we have a look at this figure again, we could see that the shape of the curve for low illuminance and high illuminance levels are different. Um, the curve becomes flatter. So can the conventional diode model, can the conventional diode models successful, successfully model PV cells at low illumination? As I have tried, for one diode and two diode models, most of the parameter instruction method can reproduce the referenced IV, cur uh, IV curve. But uh, if we have a test on the scalability, uh, which means that at low illuminance, can the one diode model be used as a scalable model? I have tested the parameter instruction method of Brano and Villawas at the um, amorphous silicon solar panel and the crystalline silicon solar panel. I have used this 1000 lux as the reference condition, and all of the parameters are extracted from this 1000 lux and scaled to other light condition to predict the IV curve of other light condition. We can see clear difference between the predicted IV curve and the measurement. Not only Brano and Villawas, other people's um, parameter instruction method for, for uh, high luminous conditions, if I uh, extract the parameter from 1000 lux and scale them to 500 lux and 100 lux, the error is bigger than Brano and Villawas. So the question will be, could the two diode model solve this problem? Two diode model is often regarded as uh, have a better accuracy for low illuminance. But as I have tried, that uh, two diode model also have these problems with high error. Why this happened? 
I have tested uh, the one diode model and have a look at uh, the parameters. Here is uh, all of the parameter extraction method of high illumination conditions. And uh, if we use them on low illuminance, we can see that uh, some parameter lose their physical meanings. For example, we can see negative resistance. And also for two diode model, this phenomenon still exists. We can see negative current and negative resistance. So one possible reason for the large scaling errors is that uh, these negative parameters could not be scaled. So it is not the one diode or two diode model itself have any problem. But uh, the parameter extraction method is too sensitive to the IV curve form, which is linked to the specific uh, PV technology. And uh, the power estimation method is very dependent on the parameter extraction method. This is related to different initial conditions, performance metrics, and ideality factor, and so on. The physically, uh, the physically infeasible parameters have no problem to reproduce the referenced IV curve, but uh, could not be scaled to another light condition. There is a large uncertainty to use diode model in low illuminance levels. So we need new models. And uh, we, the new mo in, for the new models, the equivalent circuit parameters are not of interest anymore since what we want to do is the power estimation, and they are only the tools uh, to get the IV curves. We need a model that uh, is uh, scalable and accurate, only, only for power estimation. So I have proposed uh, a 3D data-driven surface model, with, uh, which is trained uh, based on the measurement IV curves uh, by linear interpolation. If you got a number of IV curves, of course you can use all of them to build this surface. But uh, as I have tried, uh, that uh, more IV curves cannot help much to increase the accuracy of this model. Only two IV curves is enough to be used to build this model. And uh, all, of all, all of the information in between can be predicted. Here is the scaling result of my 3D data-driven surface model. The IV curve fit each other well and have successfully avoided the errors caused by the diode models. When the two referenced IV curve that used to build the surface changed, a trend of smaller error with a smaller range appears. Since the model can only be used to predict uh, the limited uh, range in between the two referenced IV curves, and the error is not so big if we uh, use the two, two IV curves with the largest uh, prediction, range, prediction range. So the two IV curves can give good results for the range of the relevant indoor conditions. And the surface model is potential to be used in the power estimation method. Now we will have a look at how to evaluate uh, my proposed uh, power estimation method. In lab environments, the possible light conditions are infinite. I have defined three possible light conditions to represent. The first one is a single light source. The second one is uh, an artificial light source mixed with sunlight. The third one is an artificial light source mixed with another artificial. Here is my experimental setup. By changing the distance between the light, uh, the light source and the sensors and the panels, we can get the parameters of different lux levels and all of the parameters can be logged and further used. 
I have evaluated many different uh, indoor light conditions, and uh, this figure is uh, one of the example. The research question is, will the spectral information contribute to the reduction of the power estimation error? We can have a look, at, uh, we can have a look in, in this figure. Uh, the fluorescent is the dominant light source of this light condition, and uh, it is interfering by a warm light by 10%, 50%, and 80%. And the error is uh, evaluated by the maximum power point percentage error. With the spectral information considerations, the result will follow the classifier's choice, which is marked by this red iron. And without considering about the spectral information, the error will follow the dominant light source. In this situation, it's the fluorescent model, and uh, which is shown in this orange bar. We can see that the error is reduced from 14% to 8%, which means that the spectral information contributes to the reduction of the power estimation error. In the real-world condition, the light conditions are more complex, and the light sources combinations are infinite. We also will have other influence factors, for example, the curtains, reflectings from walls, and the illuminance and the spectrum of the real-world condition is always time-varying. So simulate the light conditions is impossible. What I want to do is to do a real-time measurement. In order to do the real-time measurement, I need to deploy the sensors and the panels to different light conditions to collect the data. So I designed this data acquisition device. Um, I have embedded the sensors and the panels on the surface. Um, the, uh, the information measured by the LUX sensor and the RGB sensor can be used for the power estimation, and the other information can be used for evaluation. Here is an example from uh, uh, my data acquisition device, which shows the spectral composition in the real-world condition for 24 hours. The red, green, and the blue color shows the spectral composition from the RGB sensor. And uh, the yellow color is uh, from the LUX sensor, which is showing the infrared spectral composition. With the sunrise in the morning and uh, the sunset in the afternoon, we can see that the LUX level changes with time. Also, the spectral composition of each channel changes with time. Here I have the energy estimation result for 24 hours for both amorphous and crystalline solar panel. I have tested uh, eight different light conditions, and the error is uh, accumulated for 24 hours. The red bar has shown my spectrum and illuminance based power estimation method. We can see that for amorphous, the error is smaller than 6%. And for crystalline, the error is smaller than 9%. For other power estimation methods that uh, do not take the spectrum into consideration, which is showing in the green, blue, and the yellow color, uh, we can see that the errors are almost always larger than my result. So based on these results, our spectrum and the illuminance-based power estimation method contributes to improve the accuracies under, under the realistic operating scenarios. So let me short conclude my research. For a uh, indoor light condition, for example, in this room, my data acquisition device can be put anywhere. Based on the measurement of the ambient environment, it can collect information to do power estimation and energy estimation. The contributions of my 
spectrum and the illuminance based uh, power estimation method is that uh, firstly, I have found a minimum spectral descriptor that is sufficient to be used to describe and classify the ambient light conditions. And uh, the one diode and two diode models have been evaluated in low illuminance conditions. And they have no difficulties in reproducing the reference condition. But they have problems in scaling to another light condition. So I, so I have proposed a scalable 3D data-driven surface model. And I have evaluated the method in lab and real-world conditions. My research fills the gap of the power estimation method in low illuminance conditions. And with limited spectral information, it has been shown that the power estimation accuracy is improved. This can be enabled by very simple measurement devices. The power estimation method is composed by light condition classifier and accurate and scalable PV models for low illuminance. And this power estimation method can be incorporated into a solar energy harvesting system design tool to support a more accurate dimensioning of the system components. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Xin Yu, for this presentation. Um, at this point, we will take a, a short break in order to set up uh, for the next step in this procedure, uh, where we have the scientific discussion between the uh, opponent and the respondent. Um, and at this point, I would also like to thank everyone who joined us on YouTube. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, I think we will take uh, is about five minutes, should we say? Ah, should we say quarter two? Is that OK? Qu then at quarter to two or quarter to one, depending on where you are, uh, we'll continue further with this session. Thank you. <laughs>